good evening everyone uh, welcome to another uh, session about uh, heart and lung transplant topics uh, today we have an interesting session about the airway complication after lung transplant tips and tricks from the expert uh, as we know that airway complication after transplant is a usual phenomenon that we see uh, especially uh, after transplant when we do the regular bronchoscopies and uh, we feel it's a great entity that uh, all the pulmonologists and the uh, surgeons who is involved should be knowing so we have two uh, uh, eminent uh, speakers and panelists one is uh, dr pradeep dabi uh, he is a moderator for the session so dr pradeep is a uh, international pulmonologist and lung transplant physician from kd hospitals where they are uh, doing regularly the heart and lung transplant uh over to pradeep uh, thank you dr vimmi for uh, kind introduction and uh, am i audible yes yes pradeep okay so uh, it is to be a very interesting topic uh, concerning to lung transplantation as we all know there is a frequent complication airway complication is very frequent and it is one of the risk factor for long term outcome and as well as uh you can say around cled like a chronic lung allograft dysfunction so without wasting my time i would introduce uh, one of our greatest speaker dr harikishan a man doesn't need an introduction he is uh, uh this is a cricket fever so he is a virat kohli of uh, our india on the platform of intervention pulmonologies so hari will speak on uh, airway complication pertaining to lung transplantation so over to you hari thank you pradeep and uh, vimi um, i hope i am audible so okay. um, uh, i am my experience with uh, lung transplant and airway complication uh, is limited so i will discuss on my experience on how we manage patients with uh, lung transplantation and airway complications um so what is the role of an interventional pulmonologist when it comes to lung transplantation and what are the different types of complications we come across and then they we get a call from the transplant team uh, to manage the airway so um, these are the uh, people who pioneered and uh, made it possible for um, people to have a new lungs for their uh, end stage lung diseases and during lung transplant usually the anastomosis happens between the donor bronchus and the recipient bronchus and airway anastomosis has traditionally been the most vulnerable site for any uh, operative complications following uh, surgery for a lung transplantation and there are many there are many complications that can happen if you see the timeline of uh, lung transplantation there are certain uh, changes the surgeons when they started doing lung transplant and to the today's surgeons the initial rate of airway complications used to be uh, the incidence used to be very high in the initial stages but as the technique evolved and then the surgeons understood what are the mistakes and why this lung uh, means the airway anastomosis complications are happening so they tried to improve on techniques and then different ways to preserve the lungs and all these things and then now if you see um with the current technique of lung transplant surgical technique usually we uh, come across rarely these complications so even though the incidence uh, if you want to um, categorize these complications you can categorize like immediate and late complications immediate uh, usually lung transplant complications happen in the first one month of uh, surgery in the first initial four weeks airway complications i mean to say and um, uh, if you categorize them like uh, in the first early one week and then post after two or four months these are the different uh, things that can happen bronchial anastomosis uh, related complications immediate complications will be like uh, um, like you have a small dehiscence or necrosis again it depends on how you calculate this uh, incidence complication because if you start looking at the necros minor necrosis and then that small area of uh, uh, necrosis that happens and if you count that as a complication then the incidence of complications go up but if you take major complications like uh, a dehiscence or um, stenosis then the complication rate might be 
Like, so if you, this table will tell you like what are the early complications and what are the late complications that also predispose to uh, airway complications and what are the common radiological findings to when to suspect uh, uh, an airway complication in these patients. So if you look at the literature, the reported incidence of airway anastomotic complications following lung transplant ranges somewhere between 2% to 33%. Again, as I told you, what you consider as a complication also matters in this because some centers uh, consider this necrosis also as a complication. And then if you report that, the incidence may go up. But the most centers in the Western uh, world, the data shows that 7 to 18 percent of them can have lung transplantation. And if you look at this large meta analysis, which studied around 35 studies, combining a huge volume like 50,000 transplants, the pooled incidence of airway complications following lung transplant stayed at between somewhere around 12.5 percentage, and uh, of which airway stenosis was the most common individual complication, which uh, accounted to around 8.4 percentage, and airway dehiscence uh, second at around 2.3. But it is most deadliest complication. So why we should discuss about this lung transplantation and airway complications is. First thing is, especially in a country like India, if the patient has um, develops an airway complication, that will add up to the cost of the lung transplantation because we know we are not an um, insurance-driven uh, country. So every procedure, uh, a general anesthesia procedure, usually we do these airway pro procedures under general anesthesia, will increase the cost of the patient following surgery. And also, it will have morbidity of these uh, on these patients. Like they make they they may have a decreased uh, quality of life if they develop airway complications. Some papers show that uh, there may not be much of survival difference if the patient whether the patient develops an airway complication or not. But if you see the large two meta analyses that are published, they definitely showed that the um, airway complications will lead to decreased survival following lung transplantation. And this is one paper which studied around 255 patients, of which 124 were double lung and 85 were single lung transplant, and studied on 343 bronchial anastomosis. So the airway complication incidence ranged somewhere between 9%. And if you see uh, the single lung Four, four patients had single lung uh, transplant, they developed airway complications and the remaining 23 who underwent double lung transplant, they had airway complications. And one interesting thing is the technique of teles telescoping uh, method, uh, whether the surgeons did a telescoping uh, anastomosis or not, it did not impact on the uh, airway complications. And uh, if you see the risk factors, what they studied uh, in this large population, modified urocholins use and um, uh, patients have, having CMV infection and patients had uh, infective airway colonization. These were the uh, single risk factors they found on univariate analysis. And if you see the multivariate analysis, patients who are on ventilator for more than 72 hours, double lung transplant, and airway colonization with aspergillus or other infections showed to have uh, increased risk of airway complications following lung transplant surgery. But surprisingly, there was no difference in survival in this squad. Um, but again, what you have to see in this paper is most of these transplant-related airway complications were successfully treated by bronchoscopic procedures. So there was not much uh, need for a redo surgery to overcome these complications. And if you look at the mortality related to these airway complications, it was only 1%. So, so the overall incidence as per this paper is around 12% for uh, airway complications. And then if you see, uh, the survival was not much uh, different between the two groups. So I already discussed with you, uh, if you see the timeline of airway complications following lung transplantation, down you can see the time and then on the left, uh, you can see on the y-axis, you can see the complications. So usually in the initial period, you will see a lot of sloughing and anastomotic dehiscence. But as the time goes on, you see exophytic granulation, bronchial stenosis, and sometimes vanishing airway syndrome of the middle lobe uh, of the bronchus intermedius, um, tracheobronchomalacia, bronchial fistulas, and anastomotic infections can come somewhere between 8 to 52 weeks. So these are considered as uh, long-term complications. And if you look at the pathogens, is why airway complications happen uh, following a lung transplant surgery is because of uh, impairment of blood flow. That is, during the lung harvest procedure, usually the normal bronchial 
blood supply is interpreted interrupted leaving the bronchial vessels at the anastomotic site will be the circulation for this will be again dependent on retrograde filling from the low pressure and poorly oxygenated pulmonary artery circulation so that is the reason why um, patients can develop airway complications and it will take around 2 to 4 weeks for this revascularization to happen so during this patient uh, this period most of these patients are prone for an ischemic insult and then they develop airway complications around the anastomotic site that is the reason why we see airway complications especially around the uh, airway anastomotic area where the surgeons um, join the donor bronchus to the recipient bronchus and uh, one more risk factor that was studied properly was excess length of the donor bronchus. So if the surgeons leave a long length of the donor bronchus to the recipient bronchus, and then the, the previous experience shows that uh, this will add up to the airway complications. So that's the reason why usually they leave one to two cartilage rings uh, on the right side and then anastomose the donor bronchus very close to the right upper lobe bronchus. But this again uh, is a very big challenge for intervention pulmonary um, uh, physicians. Why? Because uh, most commonly when we start uh, doing a bronchoscopic um, procedure, stenosis happens very close to the right upper lobe. And then when we have to place a stent in some patients, um, I, I mean to say on uh, covered metal stents, uh, sometimes the right upper lobe uh, gets closed or uh, we don't have enough length to put a stent because of the upper lobe closure. So we have some special stents to overcome this problem. But again, this closeness, though it will decrease the airway complications, it's really a big problem for the intervention teams to manage because of the close proximity of the right upper lobe to the anastomosis. And then managing that area is a little challenging for us. And uh, um, previously, the surgeons used to do this something called an omentoplexy, where they put a piece of omentum around the anastomosis, and that showed to have high rates of uh, descents. That is why now I think most of the surgeons do not uh, perform this. And again, uh, telescoping anastomosis, like uh, if you see on the left, you see end-to-end -end anastomosis, and this is what the telescopic an anastomosis means, like they put the... Um, recipient uh, bronchus and the donor bronchus into the recipient bronchus and then stitch submit. This technique, as per most papers, they show that they, it is more uh, likely that this will be a risk factor for developing post-operative uh, airway complications like stenosis and dehiscence. But most of the uh, current recommendations suggest to do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. So this is one thing uh, mainly from the surgical part. And uh, we will discuss the risk factors in one go in the last slide. Like if you have uh, patients who are on prolonged mechanical ventilation before the surgery, there also are high risk for developing airway complications. And right-sided anastomosis, as I told you, um, because more likely, it is more likely, even our experience also shows that most of the patients will have airway complications on the right compared to the left. Uh, that is why, because of uh, this one reason, because right bronchus is perfused by only one bronchial artery versus two on the left. So that is why they say that more complications happen here. And uh, some changes in organ perfusion over the period of time also happen. And then the, now the current uh, preservatives um, uh, help to prevent airway complications. So the previous preservatives used to have high incidence of complications. The current preservatives uh, have less incidence of airway complications following lung transplant surgery. And uh, if you look at the airway surveillance, so again, it depends. It's, it's again a point of debate. When do you do or do you have any specific uh, time points when you do uh, airway inspection? Again, um, when you have a drop in FE1, whether you perform a bronchoscopy. So again, some centers that don't do bronchoscopic surveillance until unless the patient develops any symptoms. But some centers do an active surveillance bronchoscopy. But it is recommended to do active surveillance bronchoscopy at specific time points. And it is important also to document the changes that happen in the airway. Because some surgeons, they are in uh, very uh, not very prone uh, putting a bronchoscopy because of the risk of infection. But with the use of single-use bronchoscopies, I think uh, we're uh, overcoming that uh, infection possibility. And uh, 
And if you look at the classification systems, uh, so many classification systems have evolved over the period of time for classifying. How do you classify these lung transplant complications? So we will look at each of these classifications, but none of the classifications are universally accepted, except that the recent ISHLT classification is being followed now. So the first classification was uh, Corot's classification, which described the macroscopic appearance of the bronchial anastomosis assessed at day 15 after transplant. But it did not include uh, the distal airway and then the full spectrum of pathology. That is why it is not universally accepted. And then there came the Tegla classification from one of our Indian uh, colleagues who are a part of this, of which um, they looked at uh, thickness of mucosal injury, extent of circumferential injury, and then extent of granulation tissue, appearance of loose sutures, presence of airway complications. But it did not include standardized grading metric. That is why universally this classification also not accepted. Again, came the Mehta's and Santa Cruz classification in 2009 based on stenosis, necrosis, and then grading each classification. And um, the only uh, thing with this classification is it did not separate dehiscence from necrosis and it is not constructed, uh, constructed as a grading system. That is why this classification is not accepted universally. And uh, if you see the ISHLT classification, this is what currently uh, um, among the centers it is followed. So they classify as ischemia and uh, necrosis, dehiscence, stenosis and malacia. And again, each of these uh, complications, they based on the location and their extent. So again, they are subdivided. So if you look at uh, ischemia and necrosis, again, location perianastomotic, which is considered as within the one centimeter of anastomosis ex um, or extending more than one centimeter to the major airways or to the lobar airway. So that is how it is classified as ABC. And again, if you see the extent of uh, ischemia and necrosis, less than 50%. More, more than 50 to 100 percent and then less than 50 percent circumferential necrosis. So different ways how they classified and then universally it is advised to report according to these. Uh, so when we do bronchoscopy also we have to write these uh, and then compare with the next bronchoscopic examination. So this is what I was talking on limited mucosal necrosis and sl sloughing. So usually you see this uh, in most of the patients who undergo lung transplantation. Uh, in the initial first two to three weeks after the transplant. It itself per se is not classified as an airway complication. So, because most of the times it is uh, self-healing uh, and healing uh, happens in two or three weeks time after the bronchoscopic examination. So, coming to bronchial stenosis, this is very important and uh, it is defined as a fixed reduction in the caliber of the airways. So, like if you see it, it, it like... Uh, if you ask me the difference between what is the difference of stenosis that happens in the trachea or, or another um, pathologies, usually you will see these kind of sutures after the like at the surgical site, and then again it is divided into central airway stenosis when the stenosis is located at or within the two centimeters of anastomosis, and uh, distal airway stenosis when the airway is distal to the anastomosis or the uh, stenosis of the low, lower bronchi are visualized. So these can, like central airway stenosis and distal airway stenosis can coexist or uh, can be a separate entity also. So the management part we will discuss later. This is how the bronchoscopic uh, appearance looks like. And this is the most common airway complication as discussed uh, before, typically occurring between first two to nine months, usually in the initial uh, four to six weeks. And then Risk factors including bronchial ischemia, early rejection, and reperfusion edema. So patients, uh, sometimes these patients may be asymptomatic. So when you do a, so the, the advantage of doing a surveillance bronchoscopy, sometimes you can find these asymptomatic patients with uh, airway complications. And some patients who have high degree of airway stenosis, they can present with dyspnea, wheezing, strider and decreasing pulmonary function test or post obstructive pneumonia. So again, a lot of secretions pooling beyond and then difficulty to cough out those. Uh, again, they can cause um, a colonization of the airway with the infective organism. So this is one thing. So again, if you see the common management of bronchial stenosis and the management of bronchial stenosis following lung transplant, usually it's the same, not much of difference. I mean, the treatment part, but uh, you have to be a little more aggressive in managing uh, stenosis in post-lung transplant uh, compared to 
uh, other pathologies in my opinion. And uh, diagnostic evaluation of stenosis, imaging may not be necessary all the time. Bronchoscopy will be the gold standard to see what is the level of stenosis and what is the distal, this thing. So usually these patients do a home spirometry and then they keep on sending their values. So whenever there is a drop, uh, then you can ask them to come for a surveillance bronchoscopy. That is one other practice that is followed. And uh, if you look at the stenosis, again, based on the site of stenosis, it can be either anastomotic site, usually which is very common, or it can be anastomotic plus lobar or subsegmental or segmental. And then the usual cotton mayer classification like thing 0 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 100, and then 100% 100 obstruction. That's how we see the extent of uh, bronchial stenosis. And uh, these are different pictures. And something called a vanishing bronchus intermediate syndrome also uh, is uh, common in these lung transplant, which we don't see in other pathologies. Uh, usually affects the bronchus intermediates, and then you see that bronchus intermediates completely uh, disappears. So when you have um, a clue that, okay, this is happening, it is very important to aggressively manage this complication with a stent or do a dilatation very uh, frequently. Um, and uh, as I discussed before, Managing this complication again comes with another risk is uh, because the airway, the right upper lobe um, takeoff is very close. So it becomes a challenge to place stents. But this is something which uh, we should know as an intervention pulmonologist because transplant is little new to this uh, fee, uh, our field. And uh, management, uh, the same line of management, what we do, uh, if it is an asymptomatic pa patient, we usually don't uh, do conservatively see and then check if there is a progressive stenosis. But if you have severe symptomatic stenosis, then uh, how we manage the conventional um, post-intubation stenosis, we manage the same like uh, doing a knife, cautery cut, cryo, and then or a laser, whatever surgery instrument you have, you can use that to open up the airway. And then use of this mitomycin, uh, all these things, uh, literature-wise did not show much uh, improvement or any uh, evidence to show that mitomycin helps to heal these uh, uh, lesions to have uh, to prevent re-stenosis, but some centers do practice uh, using application of glucocorticoids and topical mitomycin. And aspergillus fumigatus infections are also strongly associated with airway complications. So it is important to medically also treat these patients. So this is how normal bronchial uh, balloon bronchoplasty is done. So the same lines of management uh, for these patients. So the, the only problem is when you start doing airway repair for transplant patients initially, you see those uh, sutures and then get a little um, like uh, frightened to dilate it uh, properly because you think that those uh, you can discuss with your surgeon so the management actually once the suture everything is set like after four weeks or six weeks period we can apply the same uh, pressures what we do for trachea also usually the risk is not that high but that initial phase is when we start doing transplants even when we started doing lung transplant airway repairs we were a little uh, skeptical in dilating with high pressure balloons, but um, they didn't lead to any complications. So you can safely do these um, balloon dilatations. Again, electrosurgical knife resections. And then if you have a refractory stenosis where you fail with the bronchial uh, balloon, then you can use a silicone stent, most preferably silicone stent. But the challenge with the management following lung transplant is most of the times you will not be able to uh, push your rigid bronchoscopy barrel beyond the uh, beyond the surgical stenotic part, anastomotic part. So then we sometimes do a bridge procedure where we put a covered metal stent and then once the dilatation happens and then you remove that and then give the space for the rigid bronchoscopy to pass and then later replace the metal stent to a silicone stent. But one thing is when you place metal stents for these patients, it is very important to do a surveillance bronchoscopy and then remove them as quickly as possible once you feel that, okay, I'm able to go and do a silicone stent in these patients. So this is one thing about the stents. Uh, and uh, uh, if we fail, uh, especially if you have a large area of descents, sometimes stents also fail. And then that is when you refer them for um, a re-surgical uh, procedure or re-transplantation. And uh, infectious part, I think we can discuss during our uh, discussion. 
I think the physicians, uh, it's more, more towards the transplant physicians than the IP guys to see. And um, if you see, uh, the, this, sometimes you see the airway and then you understand, okay, something something like an aspergillus infection or mucormycosis of the airway. You, If you keep on closely doing bronchoscopies, you understand what type of infection these patients might be having. And then quickly treating with them with antifungals will help them. And then granulation tissue management remains the same, like how we manage granulation in uh, normal airways. So this is how bronchial necrosis and dehiscence uh, look like. Again, degree of uh, dehiscence uh, you know, varies from a small area of tear where you conservatively manage to a large tear where you put this uh, uncovered metal stent. So when you have an area of dehiscence, it is recommended to place uncovered metal stent so that granulation tissue and then healing can happen. Um, so here you can see four different pictures of uh, varying grades of uh, uh, dehiscence. The last one definitely will be very difficult to manage because of the necrosis and all these things. And um, management, again, as I said, depends on severity of necrosis. If necrosis involves the mucosa but not the bronchial wall and there is no air leak, you don't have to go and do an aggressive bronchoscopic procedure and then add on to the patient cost and burden. So you can conservatively manage with antibiotics and frequent surveillance bronchoscopies. But when there is a significant anastomotic uh, bronchial dehiscence, then placement of, as I told you, usually we uh, don't put these uncovered self uh, metal extents in, um, in any other indications now in intervention pulmonology, but uh, this is one indication where they recommend to put um, uncovered SEMS and then removed after four to six weeks of healing. So removal, because again, if the patient doesn't, the major challenge with Indian transplant patients is they don't come for follow-ups regularly. And then if they come after a long period, like six weeks, six months or a uh, year, and then these stents will have a very bad granulation and becomes a nightmare for the IP guys to remove these um, stents. And here are some examples of uh, images showing dehiscence and also one of the case shows there is a bronchomediastinal fistula. Uh, so, and um, tracheobronchomalacia, again, it is very important uh, because patients will come with a lot of cough and these things. So, usually incidence is reported to be somewhere between 1 to 4 percent. Again, it, uh, again, as I told you, as per the recent ISHLT classification on the location, you have to see whether it is perianastomotic area or away from the area and occurs within the four, first four, usually in the first four months. Uh, symptoms are similar to those uh, patients having TBM with non-transplant, coughing, wheezing, dyspnea, and then sputum production and res recurrent respiratory infection. These are how this patient come. And you can do an inspiratory, expiratory images on the CT and then you can understand. But sometimes these dehiscence and um, you know, this tracheobronchomalacia is very limited to the um, area of the anastomosis that you may not uh, identify on uh, uh, imaging. So it is better to do a uh, conscious uh, bronchoscopy on these patients, uh, dynamic bronchoscopy, and then you can see how, how they feel. And uh, fistulas also we see uh, bronchopleural, bronchomediastinal and bronchovascular fistulas. The last one is catastrophic. And uh, a simple bronchopleural fistula, usually uh, we can manage if there is no pneumothorax conservatively or you can put a small glue and then cyanoacrylate glue and manage these complications. Again, the management remains the same like how you manage other ways of uh, fistulas. This classification and all you can read. Um, so I'll share you uh, one case uh, example, like how uh, we managed a patient with uh, lung transplant related airway complications and then how we were able to manage this patient. So now you can see um, this is a patient post uh, COVID with uh, prolonged uh, oxygen support and then patient underwent a double lung transplantation. And then as you can see here, uh, the left anastomosis was quite good, but the right bronchial anastomosis, if you see there is a focal bronchomalacia and also there is uh, stenosis at the uh, anastomotic site and also some amount of granulation tissue covering the area. So uh, 
So the usual management, first you do a degranulation using a cryo or you can use your electrosurgical instruments, slowly cut open the stenotic segment. So what we did mostly was like we used an electrosurgical knife to just open the airway and then used cryo on this area where there is a granulation tissue. And then just pass a quick thin bronchoscopy to assess the distal uh, airways, whether they are patent or not, or how is there any secretions, and then suck out. And then you can see the application of uh, cryo. The current literature also um, supports the evidence that uh, cryo application in these patients will uh, prevent uh, re-stenosis. Um, so what we are actually trying to um, do is like degranulate using the cryoprobe here with the applica application. And and then do a balloon dilatation following this. We did a balloon dilatation and you can see the posterior wall of the uh, right upper lobe longer. And then we place a small um, silicone stent to keep the lumen patent. So the, you see the left uh, uh, anastomosis is quite good, no problem. But uh, on the right side, you can see there is one um, area which we, uh, again, here, if you see, I just cut the stent uh, uh, to keep the right upper lobe uh, open, but I could not place it exactly to the same lane, but somehow I was able to maintain the opening. So now this is the area of uh, before the procedure, and then you can see the opening of the right upper lobe also uh, is maintained by the use of this uh, silicone stent. And then we remote the stent at around 12 or 14 months in this patient with a complete patent airway. So curative intent uh, management with silicon stent happen, and then we remove this uh, stent. And um, so if you look at, uh, to conclude, like um, these are the risk factors that will um, trigger uh, airway complications following lung transplantation. Severe primary graft dysfunction, acute rejection within the first post-transplant year, pre and post-operative pulmonary infections, prolonged mechanical ventilation before surgery, Aspergillus colonization, preoperative Burkhold area infections, and use of sterolimus prior to the complete anastomotic healing, and donor recipient, um, sorry, this is recipient, uh, spelling mistake, height mismatch also will lead to airway complications following lung transplant. So these are things we should uh, remember um, and then have a keen eye on these patients and then see whether they develop airway complications or not. But uh, if you ask our experience uh, with the current uh, uh, transplant team, uh, we have great transplant surgeons now, Dr. Bala and uh, Dr. Manjunath. So we uh, actually, our incidence of airway complications, we started lung transplant during COVID. Uh, we had a lot of uh, airway dehiscence and all. But uh, because those were infected patients mostly, and then a lot of them were on mainly on prolonged mechanical ventilation and ECMO support. But in the recent times, uh, we see... Uh, these type of complications much, much uh, less. So we are not being called much for uh, uh, managing an airway. That is a good sign. Uh, so the incidence has come down significantly in our institute and um, the post-transplant uh, physicians also and the intensivists are doing a great job. So with this, I would like to end my lecture and thank the transplant team for asking me to speak on my limited experience on post lung transplant and airway complications. I'm happy to answer any questions or if you have any doubts regarding this lecture. Thank you, Hari. It's a very good presentation. Thank you. And you have covered all the aspects of lung transplant related airway complication. So now I'm over to Vimmi. Vimmi, can you have some questions? Uh, sir, in, in our previous, uh, I, mean, I mean, in our transplant, uh, in our setting also, is it uh, usually the stenosis that we come across, sir, or you feel it's more decent, sir? Um, because we we started transplant as you know during the COVID more, more transplants happened during COVID so we saw more actually more dacins and uh, this necrosis in patients after transplant so stenosis actually are very very few cases are hardly we had around four to five cases in this big big number of transplants what you guys did and uh, we were only called four or five times to do a um, stenotic repair or place a stent 
in these patients. So um, I think uh, in our series, if we see uh, in the COVID era, necrosis and dehiscence, post COVID, um, after you IP guys came, I think you never called us for um, an airway competition, right? Till now. Yes. Yes. And the yes. patient selection might be different. And I think other good thing that happened is I think probably we are also using the uh, more of uh, antifungal prophylaxis, more of nebulization for all our transplant patients for three, three, at least three months, which has dramatically improved. Even though we see a lot of uh, airway infections and purulent discharges even after transplant and which dramatically improves uh, over the time. And as Dr. Hari sir said, uh, in the first two weeks, we see a lot of granulations and many other sloughing during the initial transplant, which uh, improves over time. And Pradeep, in your experience, uh, uh, what is your take on uh, uh, from, a, uh, from a pulmonologist point of view, when they should intervene and when do you usually call for a IP team to intervene in your uh, regular post-transplant uh, patients? So we me generally we are not seeing that much. <clears throat> Most of the patient will improve with the conservative management. Here we won't be that much aggressive. If we do a surveillance bronchoscopy very frequently, if we give a good amount of like as you told prophylactic medications like uh, to prevent GNB infection, to prevent aspergillus colonization and all, then the complication rate is very very low. Sometimes down the line at around two months, three months. Some patient can develop a strictures and uh, he, he may need some balloon dilatation and all, but still we are seeing very less, very, very less frequently this airway complication. If we manage with a good conservative management and surveillance bronchoscopy, the incidence is very low. Okay. But if patient is on like prolonged mechanical ventilator, one of our patient had a very bad GNB infection. Uh, heart and lung transplant patient. So he needs very low perfusion. So the airway is very necrotic and ischemic and uh, prophylactically we put, put a wise stent and then we removed after a one month uh, once the airway healing up happens properly. So it is challenging, but you can manage it uh, endoscopically. Okay. Okay. And in that uh, patient with the y which you have placed a wise stent, what was the initial I mean, uh, the bronchoscopic appearance, like it was like a... Uh, it was it was a lot of ischemia and necrosis. And other thing is because of low cardiac output, he needs a very high inotropic support. So healing of the airway was very, very slow. And if you see in between the cartilage, now, there was a lot of like um, mucosa was very unhealthy. So there was a lot of collapse of the both the side of the major bronchus. So before the dehiscence happened, we put a wise stent and uh, the result was very good. We removed the wise stent after one month. Okay. okay. Uh, other thing to uh, Heidi, sir. Uh, sir, uh, when, uh, uh, what is the grading system that you recommend to all the pulmonologists uh, here, sir? Uh, because there are multiple grading and everybody gets... Uh, confused, but from your point of view, what do you suggest, sir? I think now everybody is uh, doing that same ISHLT uh, classification. So I think I think keeping a good video recording of uh, every surveillance, what you do and uh, maintaining a diary for them also plays a very important. Uh, now we don't see uh, many complications. Uh, maybe as we as we see more and more number of transplants, maybe our incidence also will come up to six to twelve percent somewhere as reported in the literature. Because actually, if you see in that way. Um, we should have more airway complications because of the spectrum of infections what we have in in this country compared to the western population but uh, maybe the surgical surgical teams are good or the uh, patient selections uh, is good that's why uh, we don't see much complications and uh, to dr pradeep uh, uh, after uh, and we may also like pradeep we started what we did was like we started uh, doing this donor bronchoscopies uh, and then start to screen them with this uh, rapid uh, multiplex pcr assist but uh, one problem what we noticed is like they pick up uh, more bugs like uh, even colonization yes, yes. bugs also 
so we are looking at whether we will be able to make a decision based on these uh, rapid uh, assays like film array panel and all on the donor bonkers before you do a transplantation i think vimi is doing uh, work on that but it will be interesting to see like again you know the panel gives many positives so deciding whether which is a real positive and then which is a false positive we need to colonizer we have to identify that uh, spectrum Yes, sir. So I think in that uh, film array panel or the rapid onset evaluation, I think we are doing the study and we are collaborating the culture report with the uh, stand, I mean, which is a standard of care with the film array and we are uh, on its way to publish the uh, that case series. And uh, from uh, from Pradeep to Dr. Pradeep, uh, after transplant, uh, Pradeep, how frequent you, like, for example, after six months or one year, do you come across uh, the airway complication frequently or is it like a chronic uh, uh, rejection? Do you come across uh, more frequently? So after six months, na, see, Hari has uh, clearly told. So and uh, he showed in slide also the in after six months, the airway complication incidence is very, very low. Whatever is happened, it happens in uh, first three to six months. So after six months is very low, but after six months, you, you see more kind of rejection. But the airway complication is one of the risk factor for chronic rejection also, which, which is very, very important. And when you read, when you define a chronic rejection, and if you look at the PFT data, you have to consider that patient also, but that patient developed airway complication or not. If the airway complication is there and it was treated previously or corrected or not corrected, which is to be considered when you consider a patient, a stem for diagnosis of chronic rejection. Okay. And Pradeep and Vimi, I want to ask you, like, what is your practice of doing uh, these biopsies for uh, rejection analysis? Do you do you routinely do, or uh, you do only in patients who are uh, symptomatic? Uh, Hari, we we are doing routinely in uh, we currently we have done around four transplants, so we are. Uh, I, I usually follow a protocol where we train. So we do generally at one month, three months, and six months, and 12 months. So, and every time uh, I'm doing as a cryo biopsy only because we have a facility of cryo and our pathologist is uh, be trained in uh, lung transplantation also at US. So um, she is very much confident on reading cryo biopsy and he, she loves to prefer a cryo biopsy because the piece, you have to take only two two to three piece, which is enough. And uh, it is adequate also. Adequacy is also good in uh, if you take a cryobiopsies. So you 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 do with the uh, thin probes or you use the 1.7 or 1.9? 1.7 probe. 1.7 probe. 1.7 and you're doing two or three biopsies per patient, yes. right? Yes, yes. So what we and Vimi was looking at is like uh, uh, doing with the, uh, like if you see that uh, recent uh, study frostbite, the 1.1 yeah. 1 1 we are looking 1 at like whether they are sufficient to, because the risk of bleeding also is less. And do you see the similar rates of bleeding after cryobiopsy in these patients or is it less because of the, because initial periods as it was described, the it takes time for the revascularization to happen. So do you see no, no, we are the same rates of bleeding uh, are following cryobiopsy or it, you, you see it's, it's a little less compared to the normal ILD cryobiopsies? No, it, is same. it is same, 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 same rate of bleeding and uh, there is no pneumothorax. Okay. Uh, I think uh, there are no questions in the chat box. So uh, I think, uh, sir, just a to wind up, sir, what is your uh, final uh, uh, word to the pulmonologists and surgeons out here about uh, the airway complication, uh, when to intervene or, or when not to intervene? Sir, you take, uh, Dr. Hari, sir, what is your take on that, sir? I, th I think we should have a very high... Um means like you you should be a little pro on doing uh, a surveillance bronchoscopy uh, following because infection was the only concern but now i think you use all single use scopes of transplant so infection is not a big uh, issue so you should be actively screening these patients and then identifying them early 
because if you send them in a very late stage like when this vanishing bronchus kind of thing happens it is it is really challenging to uh, it's very easy for us to manage those complex uh, uh, means malignant tumors and all but when it comes to transplant uh, little challenges are there you cannot pass your rigid bronchoscopy barrel so easily so i think early intervention would be more helpful um, in my opinion uh, again yeah some most of the time like after surveillance if you feel like there is no need to intervene I mean, doing an intervention is not the point, like uh, conservative line of management also helps, but those high risk groups where they can progress, uh, definitely you have to uh, intervene fast in those patients. Pradeep, you are uh, take on uh, the, this question. Yeah, so one thing is there, uh, your documentation. So whenever you do a bronchoscopy uh, uh, in surveillance bronchoscopy in a patient, a post transplant patient, to follow that, you have to uh, you have to classify that complication as Hari told. I generally prefer to do uh, this MDS classification as we follow in UN. So it is very easy, and uh, then we document that. So we remember that what happened last time, and then how the patient is progressing, and what is the FEV1, what is the patient's um, uh, symptoms, and then uh, we intervene. More um, more looks like uh, most of the complications na, they can uh, heal by itself. So hardly around 5-10% need some kind of intervention as Hari told rightly. So in that kind of may need a balloon dilatation or pottery or to remove of stent. And other thing is sometimes there are a lot of granulation tissue. So uh, if you remove that granulation tissue, you can even prevent a fungal colonization and you even you can prevent this type of stricture also. So which is very, very, so you have to be very proactive uh, to manage this type of uh, airway complications. Uh, so I think uh, we have we don't have any more questions. So thanks to Dr. Hari sir and Dr. Pradeep for uh, participating in this session. It was a wonderful session to all the pulmonologists about the new entity of, about the airway complication, especially in uh, lung transplant. It is very new and. Uh, when more and more centers are doing a transplant, it was a very enlightening session. Uh, so I think it gives a overall idea to everyone about when to intervene, the need of uh, our surveillance bronchoscopy and what are the usual modality that we come across while dealing with the airway complication. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.